for us, yeah, it's it's um, it's pretty dangerous work. Um, our guys are, that are on staff doing this full time, they're uh, they're willing to die for these kids, and uh, and they're in environments where that's quite a possibility. Uh, they they usually have to meet um, a financial requirement, and the reality is that they're they can be purchased for sex acts for a pretty low amount. So we're seeing um, they may be forced to service as many as 20 customers a day. Um, so it's a it's a ridiculous amount, and really that plays a lot to what the physical toll is for these women, and really the the desperate need for us to go in and get them out is their life expectancy is quite short because of the the physical abuse that they go through, um, being abused that many times. Kind of more of the the typical situation is where we find young girls whose uh, families have sold them from the hill tribes um, with the intention of having them go and find work. And in those environments, those kids have no paperwork, they don't speak the language and don't have any education. So when they send them on to a city, they can't find work anywhere other than working in a brothel. So what we need to do is, is kind of help build a relationship with them. So we go in posing as customers. And we'll talk to the mom and son and ask for, you know, a young girl. And um, it's way too easy to find them. You can just a matter of minutes and they can be have a young girl next to you. It took about five minutes in just this last December and the first brothel I went out with the guys. Um, we sat down and all of a sudden there's you know, a 16 year old girl sitting right next to me and a 17 year old across the table. And, and then kind of they had a, another older girl that was managing the two because the girl next to me, it was her third day in the brothel and she was pretty nervous and, and struggling. Um, to uh, know how to do her job well. It's kind of new in the brothel. So that's, that's kind of um, how you start. And so in that environment, our primary concern is the safety of the kids. So what we want to do then is building that relationship. We build the trust to break through the psychological bondage that those kids have, helping them understand that somebody loves them and cares for them so we're not touching them like all the other um, clients that come in and uh, they really do start to trust. So what we have to do in order to keep them safe is we can't offer them a way out the first night because there's too much of that fear of, you know, they might, their family or debt or whatever it would be, it's holding on to them. So what we want to do is continue to keep going back to them night after night and uh, our teams can shift that around. And so, if, you know, it's not too obvious what we're doing to the brothel to keep everybody safe. And we'll just keep going back, giving her safe nights by spending time with her, keeping other men from, from raping her. And then eventually, she loosens up and she might, you know, I love you guys, I want, uh, I don't want to be in here anymore, I hate my mama son. And then we know that she trusts us. A normal customer would then rape her and she has to walk back and continue to do that all day long and as many as 20 customers every single day. So for us, um, we meet with our staff, like a counselor and um, some other staff and we just kind of let her know you know you can trust us so just come with us and uh, that's kind of how that works so for us that's been awesome this year we're at 214 rescues it's not safe for them to go home their families may have been the ones who actually sold them or sent them on with a trafficker so um, they're in our care and we need people to help help us take care of them what about the local authorities um, well it's um it's a 30, it's estimated to be a 32 billion dollar a year industry, the sex trade is. So there's just a ton of money that countries can be making by having income from the sex trade. So um, there can be corruption and that can be a difficult thing to see, um, see a country that, that might be struggling uh, financially um, to benefit from the sex trade. So having us work with governments is really important and we're seeing a lot of increased opportunities in those ways. Um, so I think, I think that uh, there's some pressure that's starting to come from stuff like our country doing the trafficking in persons report every year that's now addressing the response that other countries throughout the world are having or are, are taking on this industry. So I think that that's encouraging those relationships to continue to grow. So we can start to partner with local law enforcements and work to see brothels shut down and work to see traffickers arrested and, and uh, even develop partnerships and in, in laws with, with law enforcement here in the U.S. that might be able to arrest U.S. citizens that would be overseas involved in the trade as well. This is a illegal act activity in those countries. Yes, yeah. So are you turning in evidence? Do you work 
side by side with local police? Yeah, we do. So um, we've had opportunities to um, exercise arrest warrants in behalf of local law enforcement uh, agents just because we can kind of blend in a little more and get into the darker places where these, you know, sex tourist um, issues are happening. Um, so that provides us those opportunities as well as, um, uh, yeah, being illegal, we can support their brothel raid opportunities. We can partner with organizations to put people behind bars who are trafficking these kids. So really being a voice for the children that we're rescuing and making sure that the uh, perpetrators are uh, prosecuted that way. Are we talking just about girls? Um, no, there's there are a large number of boys that are in the trade as well. For us, um, the the girls are more available in most of the countries where we serve, and the 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 problem is so great that our our facilities are set up currently to mostly address that need. Um, but there's definitely um, development in room for that development to be able to rescue the boys as well. We do this year. We opened up our first boys' home and that's in Mozambique, and we've got a couple boys out in the home now, and I just received an international report that we're looking to see a lot more of those rescues taking place soon. And I don't think you said, but w once a rescue happens, a trust is built and a rescue happens, where are they taking, taken? Yeah. yeah, right now we have about 26 properties with safe homes. So the first thing we want to do is take care of their physical needs and make sure all the... Um, you know, abuse psychologically as well as physically is addressed. So ongoing counseling as well as blood checks and everything, and we do investigation and know where they came from. Um, but for them, when we do that investigation, we can find out if it was safe for them to go home. And in most cases, it's not, so they need aftercare. And um, I think our aftercare program is pretty fantastic. So on our 26 properties, the kids can come. The, the younger ones, the, the younger children, so like 14 and under, um, they would go to more like a house parent kind of situation where we have parents, uh, house parents that are nationals, like a Christian couple that would take care of them. Um, and then the older, the older, like the young women who are 14 or older, it's legal for them to work full time. And I mentioned earlier that they kind of, well, they, they are there often because of poverty and they need to send money back to their families. So that's where vocational training comes into play, is we're able to offer them employment so they can care for their families and also vocational training so they can have a future um, yeah but these guys are serious when they say they're willing to die for these kids and and that's really why like for us here we can be a voice and we want to be just as dedicated to make sure people stand up and speak up for the, the rights of these kids Yeah, we are. <laughs>